applied in the first place. Cleanliness was necessary to prevent sickness, and consequently, everything relating to it was medical. That, in the next place, the orderly officer was absent from Longwood when the request was made to me. That, even if he had been present, delicacy would prevent a lady from making demands to him for certain necessary articles, which she could, with propriety, mention to her surgeon, and that I did not conceive it to be a crime to desire a tradesman to purchase chamber utensils, naming them, or similar articles, either for Madame Bertrand or myself. His Excellency, as usual, flew into a violent passion and said that he would not allow me to insult him in his capacity of governor and was otherwise very violent. Asked me, how dare I order articles to be sent out of the king's stores without consulting him or to have them charged to those stores? I replied that I had said nothing about charging them to the king's stores. A reference was then made in my letter to Mr. Darling, which the governor had in his possession and which confirmed my statement. Notwithstanding this, he continued his abuse and made some commonplace remarks upon the delicacy of French ladies. I asked for written orders in order to prevent the possibility of a mistake, which he refused to give. I then asked if the ladies required me to purchase some articles for them in the shops, what reply I was to make. After some hesitation, I said that if they wished me to purchase anything for them myself, I need not refuse, but that if they asked me to apply to another to purchase anything for them, I was not to comply with it. He was very violent for a great part of the time, and I had much difficulty in rep presenting a, in repressing a smile at the serious manner in which he treated this important subject. No alteration of importance has taken place in the state of Napoleon's complaint. Had some discourse with him upon the libels which had been published at his expense. Well, the libels and pamphlets against me, said he, with which your ministers have inundated Europe, not one will live to posterity. During the reign of Louis the Fourteenth, and even under Henry the Fourth, the press teemed with libels, not one of which is now to be found. The labors of those wretches employed by your ministers to dance over the ruins of their own country will die in a similar manner. When I was asked to write or cause to be written answers to them, I replied, Une victoire, un moment de plus est la véritable réponse. I said, a victory or... A monument would be a better response. Besides, it would have been said I paid for the writing of them, which would have been discreditable. Posterity will judge by facts. Calumny has exhausted all her poisons on my person. I shall gain every day. La première fure passe, je ne conserve plus ennemi que du sot ou du méchant. Once the premier fury is past, I won't have any enemies except idiots and evil people. When there is not a trace of those libels to be found, the great works and monuments that I executed and the code of laws that I formed will go down to the most distant ages, and future historians will revenge the wrongs done to me by my contemporaries. I asked if, in his own mind, he believed that Blank was privy to the death of Blank. There's not a doubt, replied he, that the attempt was made with his consent. The empress added he never could bear the sight of any of the murderers afterwards and never would receive them. But one is now aide to camp to blank. After the execution of the Duke Donguillon Blank, said he, ordered a service to be celebrated for his death. I did not like this and caused his conduct relative to the death of his own father to be served up to him in prose and verse. Lord Blank, continued he, was also privy to it. He was the most intimate friend of Pete, the principal contriver and actor. This was well known at Petersburg. He mentioned that Talleyrand certainly had first suggested the attempt upon Spain, partly through hatred of the Bourbon family and partly in hope of filling his pockets, conversing on the policy adopted by our ministers. It would have been better for England, he observed, to have left me on the throne, as Russia, Austria, and Prussia would, through jealousy of me, have given commercial advantages to England. There is nothing now to prevent their taking steps to promote their own commercial interests by injuring those of England. Moreover, 
having great influence with the French nation and being loved by them, I could have given you a favorable commercial treaty, which the Bourbons, who are hated, dare not propose. But in truth, there was nothing really to be feared from France under my sovereignty until she has an army of 500,000 men. France is not to be dreaded. Besides, it was always for the Allies to grant peace. France was tired of war and was frightened the idea of new conquest. I succeeded in beating the Allies because I attacked them in detail and destroyed one power before the army of the other could arrive to support it. Hundreds of years have probably elapsed before circumstances will arise similar to those which concentrated such a massive power in me. I repeat that there was nothing to be feared from me. For if I had attempted new conquest, the opinion which brought me back from Elba would have thrown me to the ground again. Messina, he observed on a former occasion, had lost himself in the campaign of Portugal, which, however, he attributed to the bad state of his health that did not permit him to sit on horseback or inspect himself what was going on. A general who sees with the eyes of others, added he, will never be able to command an army as it should be. Messina was then so ill that he was obliged to trust to the reports of others and consequently failed in some of his undertakings. At Bissaka, for example, he attempted to carry a position almost impregnable in the manner he attacked it, whereas... If he had commenced by turning it, he would have succeeded. This was owing to his not being able to reconnoiter personally, he added. That if Messina had been what he was formerly, he would have followed Wellington so closely as to be able to attack him while entering the lines before Lisbon, before he could have taken up his position properly. 14th. Sir Hudson Low at Longwood asked me several questions about Napoleon's health. I observed that it was very extraordinary. He did not take exercise that if he expected by confining himself to obtain any further relaxation in the system adopted, he was mistaken. He then inquired if the want of sleep was caused by mental or bodily disease. I said that I thought it was chiefly caused by the want of exercise that no man leading such a life as Napoleon did could possibly remain long in a state of health. The governor said with a sneer that he believed laziness was the cause of his not taking exercise. I replied that when he first came to the island, he had taken a great deal. He then said, that he wanted to have information of his state of health more frequently and desired me to mention anything extraordinary to Captain Blakeney. I said that it would be very easy to arrange matters by sending him bulletins describing Napoleon as the patient, giving copies to Count Bertrand at the same time. This he refused to allow, saying that as long as verbal reports could be got, he did not think written ones, were of consequence. He also made some insinuations about his not having seen Mr. Baxter. In the course of conversation this day, Napoleon expressed his disapprobation of our custom of shutting up shops and prohibiting people from working on Sundays. In reply to what I said, he remarked, for those who are at their ease, it may be very right and proper to discontinue working on the seventh day, but to oblige a poor man who has a large family without a meal to give them, to leave off laboring to procure them victuals, is the height of barbarity. If such a law be enforced, provision ought to be made by your government to feed those who on that day have not wherewithal to purchase food and who could not obtain it if permitted to labor. Or let your gore-bellied priests give a portion of their dinner on that day to the starving poor whom they will not allow to work. They would have an apoplexy or an indigestion the less. Besides, it has not served the cause of morality. Idleness is the mother of mischief, and I will wager that there is more drunkenness to be seen, that there is more vice and more crimes committed in England on Sunday than any other day of the week. Speaking upon the possibility of cordially uniting the Negroes with the whites, Napoleon observed that it had occurred to him that the only mode of effectually reconciling the two colors would be to allow polygamy in the colonies, that every black or white man should be permitted to have a wife of each color, 
by such means he thought that in the next generation nearly all would be alike and consequently all jealousy and hatred done away he added that it would have been easy to have obtained a dispensation from the pope to that effect he also said that he considered the negroes to be a race different than the whites saw napoleon again in the evening who made some observations upon the governor who he observed had passed by his windows i never see that governor said he without thinking i view the man heating the poker as you font levar de fer for your edward the second in berkeley castle la nature m'a prévenu contre et gave me a friendly warning the first day I saw him. Come, Cain, la nature l'a bien cacheté. If I were in London and Sir H. Low were presented to me en bourgeois, dressed normally, I should reply, c'est le bureau de la municipalité. I would say it's the execution of the town. You cannot say, added he, that it arises from prejudice against your nation, as I have been so with Cockburn. Never did I for a moment, as you will know, suspect or distrust him in the slightest matter. From him, I would readily have received a surgeon or anything else. I had every confidence in him, and even after we had differed. But I think that I see this blank or heating the poker. He wanted to encircle the house with grills de fer, the iron gates, in order to make the second cage de fer de Bajazai, make another iron cage, for which purpose he put his government to the useless expense of sending out a shipload of iron bars to make his cage. I recommended him to see Mr. Baxter, adding that it would be a satisfaction to me to have the assistance of the advice and opinion of another medical person. He replied, Il governatore sen a misiado. È vero che la sua fisionomia è buona, ma è troppo attaccato a quel poha. Le governor è blank. Il rend a dieu tout ce qui se passe entre les mains. Therefore, I think that he must have suffered by contact with him. Besides, he has been recommended by him, and that is sufficient to prevent me from ever seeing him. If I, malheureusement, unhappily added he, had such a physiognomy, the world would then believe the libelers. Look, they would say, oh, look at the countenance of the sclera. See the murders of Wright, Pichigrew, and of a thousand others stamped on the visage of that monster. The 18th summoned to attend a plantation house by letter from Major Gorker. As the reader must already be disgusted with the details of the manner in which the governor took advantage of his situation to insult and oppress an officer inferior in rank because the latter refused to be his spy, I shall not fatigue him with any further account of the conduct practiced towards me on this day. That my replies and refusals to disclose Napoleon's conversations caused me to be treated in a more outrageous manner than on the 18th of last month. The governor followed me out of the room, vociferating after me in a frantic manner, and carried his gesture so far as to menace me with personal violence. <laughs> 